that in many ways precipitated this project. Um, pardon me for fidgeting with my, my phone and trying to just uh, set my time here so that I don't speak for too long and that we can get into some back and forth Q and A's. But there are a couple of driving questions right, that inspire this work. Uh, principally, how and why? How and why did African peoples of various backgrounds, national origin, ethnicities, religious traditions, how and why did various African peoples of the Americas, how and why did they come together to create not only a pan African community over the course of the 20th century, but a pan African movement? And so I, I lay that out in the introduction. In chapter one, I introduce this, this concept of the messianic moment. And looking at the antecedents of revolutionary Black thinking, revolutionary Black politics, going back to the long 19th century and the ways that uh, newly emancipated Africans, right, in the United States and the Caribbean and elsewhere are engaging with notions of history and reconstructing the African past. Um, and principally, they're almost preoccupied with this idea of having to learn Greek and Latin, and sometimes Hebrew. And going into European archives in order to understand the secrets about the African past and basically what Europeans had uncovered and then concealed about nilotic African civilizations principally. And so the messianic moment is this intellectual history in its purest form. But out of this intellectual history, I've mapped the ways that um, revolutionary Pan-Africanism in the interwar period, starting with that very stout ebony hue Jamaican immigrant who arrives in the United States on the 23rd of March, 1916, and who would forever change the course of the history of humanity. Some of you might know him as Mosiah Garvey, Marcus Mosiah Garvey. And so the messianic moment looks at messianism in, in diasporic African thoughts and politics. Um, and it is rooted in, in, in indigenous notions of African religious or spiritual systems that there's no revolution, no successful revolutionary struggle to overthrow the yoke of European bondage or any form of anti-Black bondage without engaging the ancestral realm. And Africans understood this, we've always understood this, despite the processes of delacination to which a genocidal transatlantic slavery subjected our forebears. Chapter two is um, space and place, sort of a, a micro history of sorts, looking at uh, various cross-border actors in the Great Lakes region. So we go from the large intellectual history to the granular of Black men and women who are forging various identities from Detroit to Windsor to Buffalo to Rochester, uh, you name it, in the Great Lakes basin. Chapter three, civil rights or human rights. I'm looking at the divergence of, of state advocacy forms of state advocacy in the United States and Canada. Canada takes a, a human rights path, the US takes a civil rights path, human rights principally because Canada was in line with the United Nations, human rights is a type of a liberal internationalist value where civil rights is predicated on the state. Right? And part two, chapter four, immigration, black power, draft resistors. So looking at the various ideas, the various individuals that would help shape um, a post-World War II Canada, individuals coming out of the Caribbean, coming out of the United States as well, both black and white. Chapter five, the mind of the state, basically looking at U.S. counterintelligence measures, counter uh, insurgency measures uh, to eliminate uh, revolutionary black organizations. Think of the Black Panther Party and the implications for Canada. And then the subject of this lecture today is chapter six, Cold Wars, Hot Wars. And so I'll provide a, a variant of that in my, my very brief lecture. I argue that 20th century revolutionary 
Pan-African nationalism posed the greatest threat to capitalist exploitation and Western domination and that Washington, as in the seat of the US empire, with active and tacit support from Ottawa, led the charge in containing global black liberation in the post-war period. And just as a side note, I will use black and African interchangeably. For me, they mean the exact same thing, sometimes different implications. So my presentation will unfold in three parts. First, I will provide some context in terms of the, the genesis, the origins of black liberation and black power um, on the North American mainland in the 1960s and 1970s. Uh, part two will provide an overview of sorts of the revolutionary geopolitical strategy that black activists deploy after the intelligence and security services in the United States and Canada jointly jointly sabotage the Black Power movement in the early 1970s. And the third and final part will highlight the counter-revolution, counterinsurgency of Black, that is, African liberation in the 1970s and 1980s. And this was, of course, a saga that implicated that, that three-letter organization, Langley, Virginia. If anyone hears Langley, you should CIA, implicated the CIA, implicated a, a Canadian US uh, weapons manufacturer, um, and implicated my employer, McGill University. So, part one. When you hear pan Africanism or Black liberation, what viscerally, like what comes to mind? Collectivity, good. Collectivity and strength, very good. Pan-Africanism, Black liberation, what comes to mind? What's like a visceral thought? Yes. Right. Unification of uh, people of African descent. Unification of people of African descent, very good. So that element of collectivism, strength, okay. Anyone else? Yes. Justice. Freedom and justice, yes, justice, absolutely. Freedom, liberation, yeah. Okay. Threatening to the status quo. Absolutely, absolutely. Deeply threatening to the status quo in the West. And we will delve into that sense of threat perception. Pan-Africanism is a simple idea, but a complex one at the same time. In simple terms, Pan-Africanism is predicated on the African idea that history is cyclical, right? Africans do not think history is linear. Africans think what goes up will come down. If we were once great, and we, if we were the first civilizers of humanity, we will once again be great. It is a process that of course connects African peoples to their ancestors, to the creator, to the spiritual world, and back and forth, right? It is a cycl cyclical process. The circle must remain intact and never broken. Pan-Africanism anticipated a glorious destiny for Black people because ebony-hued, nilotic Africans and their civilizations in antiquity had no rivals in the known world. Pan-Africanism posited that only collective self-determination could liberate the masses of Black people transform their material conditions throughout the African world from anti-Black violence and exploitation. Historically, anti-Black violence has been pivotal to encouraging Black people to lean on one another and forge solidarity, regardless of ethnicity, various tribal marks, religion, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. In fact, racial subordination and racial subjugation of Black people often inspired other Black folk of different backgrounds to find commonality. 400 years of a genocidal process called transatlantic slavery create, and we should always qualify transatlantic slavery. This wasn't just selling Africans and laboring in the Caribbean. This was genocide, and you should call it what it is. 
400 years of genocidal transatlantic slavery created a new African of sorts in the Atlantic world. One of the worst crimes against humanity, transatlantic slavery emerged out of a geopolitical and theological milieu that justified genocidal conquest of the ebony hue peoples of Africa. And think of the Abrahamic religions and, and notions of, of Ham being the cursed one and the progenitor, Ham and Canaan being cursed and the progenitors of the black race, right? Utter, utter bullshit. Like this was, and Job tells us that this was created in antiquity to justify the expulsion of the Canaanites from what is present day Israel and Palestine. So if you really want to throw gasoline on that already volatile situation, say that it was black folk who occupied that land initially. But no one's ready to have that conversation. Transatlantic slavery was merely the European vision of a truly global persecution and exploitation of African peoples. For example, Middle Eastern caliphates had overseen trans-Saharan slavery for a thousand years. And for many centuries, Arab and South Asian enslavers had inaugurated similar extraction of black bodies in Eastern Africa for voyage across the Indian Ocean into Arabia and the Indian subcontinent. So the scattering of Africa's sons and daughters to the four winds of this earth indeed created new black identities, inspiring a unique form of black racial resistance. As far, and I teach my students that as far away as Southern Iraq, Basra, for example, you see brothers and sisters who look just like us, right? They speak fluent Arabic, they've been there for centuries. But in a place like Basra, in 860 AD, an enslaved, Enslaved Africans mounted arguably the greatest, what the Jeffersonians would call, servile insurrection in human history. It nearly toppled the most powerful empire, government of the day, the Abbasid Caliphate, which was a global military superpower. And we know from the writings of an African Iraqi named Al Jahiz, who was a polymath of sorts in Basra at the time that there was a, what we can call a proto-pan-African racial consciousness of sorts among the enslaved Africans in the Abyssinian Caliphate. They came from various parts, Bantu-speaking peoples came from various parts of the continent, but enslavement allowed them to understand their blackness vis-a-vis -vis the non-blackness of their oppressors, the non-Africanness of their oppressors. Of course, what these enslaved African ancestors nearly and narrowly missed, they, like I said, they nearly toppled the, the most powerful empire of the day, their revolution, servile insurrection. What they narrowly missed accomplishing in southern Iraq, African ancestors almost a thousand years later would accomplish on the island of Saint Domingue, Haiti, in January 1804. And the Haitian Revolution, which is central in terms of how I imagine revolutionary Pan Africanism and how I frame my book, the Haitian Revolution was easily the greatest feat in the history of the Atlantic world and unequivocally the most unprecedented revolution in human history. And nowhere in the Americas, and certainly nowhere in the known world, have a group of African peoples done more to advance revolutionary pan-Africanism by vanquishing the spell of foreign preponderance over African minds and on African bodies than what enslaved Africans achieved in the French colony of Saint-Domingue from August 1791 to December 1803. The organizing principle of the Haitian Revolution was what Marcus Mosiah Garvey would later call race first. Race first. In the face of improbable odds, the enslaved Africans in Saint Domingue subordinated their religion, they subordinated their ethnicity or their tribal marks, they subordinated language, they subordinated class, they subordinated gender and other markers of identity to their ultimate identity. 
their Africanness, their blackness. This is race first. This is the most revolutionary form of Pan Africanism. It is the spirit of race first that gave Pan Africanism meaning and revolutionary urgency in the Atlantic world. And the spirit of race first was foundational to the Black Power era at the tail end of the civil rights movement. The civil rights movement's promise of nominal integration or pseudo desegregation alienated a critical mass of Black people in the United States and Canada who yearned for true emancipation from the visible and invisible chains of white domination. Political persecution of Black activists and government assassinations of Black messiahs, Negro messiahs, that is ethical, courageous, selfless, outspoken, revolutionary Black male leaders such as Omawale, Malcolm X, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Chicago Black Panther Party Chairman Fred Hampton, and countless others radicalized the masses. In fact, the creation of the Black Panther Party was self-defense. Every time we say or reference the Black Panther Party, we must always qualify self-defense, right? It grew out of a context where Black folk needed to knuckle up and resist police brutality and U.S. fascism. So it was Black Panther Party for Self-Defense, Genesis in October 1966 in the Bay Area, and its embrace of revolutionary struggle against racist capitalist exploitation was a direct result of Malcolm's teachings. And Malcolm is, of course, a quintessential revolutionary Pan-Africanist. Right? When Malcolm has his break from the NOI, the Nation of Islam, Malcolm travels to the continent. We see Malcolm in real time becoming very, very African, right? The NOI, the Nation of Islam, is a Black nationalist organization. But even more important within the nation's framework is notions of uh, is religion, is Islam, and then sort of Arabic culture. And we see when Malcolm makes his break and he goes to Nigeria and he is reborn again, as Africans often become reborn and take on new names and identities, we see that Malcolm is without a doubt on that march towards having a greater sense of his African identity. And it is Malcolm's teachings, of course, that would inspire the creation of the Black Panther Party for self-defense. And Malcolm's mom and dad were both Gar uh, Marcus Garvey's uh, lieutenants. So Malcolm comes from the fold, right? He, he was born in the cut. There's no faking in him. Black people across this country embraced this Black power movement as well, forging connections with Black Panthers and other revolutionaries in the United States, the Caribbean, and certainly across the, the Atlantic and Africa. The FBI's counter subversion or counterintelligence, as in Counterintelligence Program or COINTELPRO declared African American revolutionaries the greatest threat to the internal security of the United States. That Black revolutionaries, dig this, the US is literally, has literally experienced a form of nuclear brinkmanship, right, with the USSR. And yet in the 1960s, Black men and women organizing their little baby girls and boys to have respect and pride of self and race were deemed as the greatest internal threat to the national security of the United States. You should never forget that and its implications. Desperate to protect its northern flank, the FBI enlisted the RCMP's security service to clamp down on cross-border activists. And eager to contain the influence of Black activists in Canada, especially after the Sir George Williams student occupation in 1969 and the FLQ-inspired October crisis in 1970, Ottawa gave the green light and the two intelligence services colluded, infiltrated, and sabotaged Black organizing in North America. 
including the Caribbean. By the early 1970s, the Black Power movement had endured many significant losses and was desperately in need of recalibration. So part two, Black activists in Canada, the United States and the Eastern Caribbean positioned African liberation as the most important front or the most important battle front for Black self-determination. African liberation, the liberation of the African continent specifically. Like the founders of Black Panther Party, other disciples of Malcolm X pursued Malcolm's dream of a continental, hemispheric, and transatlantic pan-African revolution, right? Think of the OAAU, Organization of Afro-American Unity. OAAU. And Malcolm was very eloquent on this front, right? That Afro-American not only included African, ethnically African-Americans, but Afro-American Black people in Canada, in the Caribbean, in Latin America, throughout the hemisphere. Okay. So when I invoke notions of a pan-African North America, I'm not doing something that sometimes us historians are guilty of doing, you know, forcing ideas into the mouths of actors who are long deceased um, or putting ideas back in the archives. I'm literally identifying what the actors have already stated themselves. African-American Owusu Sadokai, formerly Howard Fuller, who was the founder of the Malcolm X Liberation University in Durham, North Carolina. So I think Durham's where Duke University is. 1969, traveled to Africa in the summer of 1971 to forge connections with anti-colonial revolutionaries. Sadakai was an acolyte of Malcolm. And I had the pleasure of first meeting Sadakai when I was an undergraduate at the University of Toronto circa 2007, 2008. He came to Toronto to give a talk and I attended and it was absolutely amazing. As you can tell I'm not so technologically savvy. It's okay. So this is Howard Fuller. And again, this is a process of reclaiming one's African roots and or African inheritance. And I was working with a group of black boys, uh, some of whom had lost their elder brothers to gun violence. And I told Dr. Dr. Fuller about it. He's a professor at uh, Marquette University in Milwaukee. And he drove down, spoke, spent like two hours with, uh, with my, my young ones uh, before he hopped on a plane at Pearson and returned to the States. Um, so this is somebody, these are individuals who are like legitimate revolutionaries, right? He, he has gone through some transformations. There's a lot of revolutionaries from his day did after everything they endured uh, from the U.S. government and a little bit from the Canadian government. After Sadokai visited Ethiopia, the Liberation Front of Mozambique, or Frelimo, invited him to Mozambique, where he was embedded with guerrilla forces resisting Portuguese colonialism. And I will borrow his words here. It is hard to tell the civilians from the freedom fighters. Frelimo is, in fact, the people of Mozambique in arms. Women are total comrades. There is no chauvinism or promiscuity or useless wolf tickets. No long rhetorical arguments. Sadakai reminded us when he was embedded with brothers and sisters in arms. When Sadakai asked his Mozambican freedom fighters, uh, brothers and sisters, how the distant kindred in the United States and Canada and the Caribbean could support their cause against Portugal, Sir Limo requested material aid and political demonstrations of pan-African 
solidarity. Diasporic support of anti-colonial freedom struggles in Africa was part of a rich pan-African tradition, such as African peoples in the Americas, in the Caribbean, the United States, and Canada, denouncing Germany's atrocities in Southwest Africa genocide, gen Germany's genocide, um, Imperial Germany's genocide in the early 1900s, um, the mobilization of support, both material, both um, fighters, right? Uh, black men who went over to Ethiopia to help uh, Ethiopia resist um, Italian fascism and invasion in 1935. So this form of transatlantic revolutionary pan-Africanism has a very rich history. And after his meeting with his brothers and sisters in arms, Sadokai noted, and I quote, liberation movements will be isolated and destroyed if we do not develop a content, a continual interest and a support base of African peoples wherever we may be. Meaning there's no African or black liberation if we do not develop a support base right, of African peoples who will provide money, provide themselves, provide everything, right, for their liberation. Inspired by the organization of African unity, the African Liberation Day Coordinating Committee chose Saturday, the 27th of May, 1972, to observe the first African Liberation Day demonstrations in key English-speaking North American locations, right? Washington, D.C., of course, is the seat of Western power. San Francisco, Toronto, right here, Antigua, Dominica, and Grenada. And in Grenada, of course, there's a, a young brother who was politically gifted. My map game is not that great, huh? Yeah. Uh, so here, here's some important sites in, in Eastern Caribbean. So in Grenada, there's a, a young brother, brilliant, intellectually brilliant, politically astute, named Maurice Bishop, who led African Liberation Day organizing on his island, Grenada. These transnational ties were more than symbolic, I argue with a, a, a moribund or nearly dead civil rights movement and a retreating black power movement in the United States, Owusu Sadokai tried to fulfill Malcolm's dream of transforming the African-American freedom struggle into a revolutionary pan-African cause with continental, hemispheric, and transatlantic dimensions. Sadokai, after all, had participated in the monumental March 1972, wow, it's 51 years ago, the March 1972 National Black Political Convention in Gary, Indiana, where 10,000 delegates, African Americans, made a valiant, although unsuccessful, push to resuscitate a conscientious Black politics instead of the bourgeois nonsense that one often sees that could address the urgent material needs of the Negro masses, of the African-American masses. To ensure successful execution of African Liberation Day on the North American mainland, Sadokai traveled to Toronto to meet a Dominican student by the name of Roosevelt Douglas. And one month before this first scheduled African Liberation Day protest in 1972, Sadokai travels to Toronto and meets Douglas and other Caribbean activists, where he addressed the importance of literally triangulating African peoples in the United States and Canada that constitutes one node or one vertex in the Caribbean, second vertex of the triangle, and Southern Africa, where Mozambique and Angola 
and Rhodesia and South Africa, et cetera, were located, right? So an actual triangulation of African peoples. And Sadukai noted, and I'll quote, the only thing that has changed is new black faces in, hi in high white spaces. So May 1972 proved to be one of the most historic moments in the history of African peoples in this hemisphere. You can see beautiful little black girls and boys, everyone rocking their natural hair. Um, this is a process. Revolutionary struggle is the process of inculcating the young as well with a sense of self. Right? And it's Garvey, it and it's this great Jamaican immigrant who has done more for African peoples and all of the African heads of state combined post-independence. And Garvey tells us that African peoples are disinherited and deracinated and dehumanized and oppressed and all these other things for we know not who we are. An African liberation day was literally predicated on Garvey's values and teachings. 65,000 Black people were marching in the streets of Washington, D.C., in Toronto, and San Francisco, and Antigua, uh, Grenada, Dominica, et cetera. Walter Rodney, who you all know, a uh, great revolutionary Pan-Africanist and intellectual and historian, said that African Liberation Day was an act of identification. You cannot be fighting for African liberation if you are operating from a European paradigm. I mean, this is simple mathematics, okay? It just won't work. It is an act of rejecting Western hegemony and embracing African identity, consciousness as acts of revolution. And the subtext of African liberation, there, of course, was that because the United States, Canada, and the neo-colonial governments in the Caribbean refused to create the conditions that would allow the black masses to enjoy material security, no other option stood on the table except for African peoples to liberate the continents of their ancestors. And as Marcus Garvey taught, without fail, when Africa is free and united under one flag, black people around the world will become free. And so this notion of a back to Africa, which is often caricatured to make Garvey look like a buffoon, but this idea of back to Africa was more than physical repatriation. It was, as Walter Rodney told, told us, an act of self-identification that linked the fates of African peoples in their pursuit of self-determination and opposition to capitalist exploitation. At the rally in DC in May 1972, a black congressman, Charles Diggs, said, and I quote, Black people in America and black people in the Caribbean understand that our African past is intimately bound up with our African future, end quote. And various luminaries attended, like, or such as Elaine Brown, who was a chairwoman of, of the Black Panther Party. Uh, who became chairwoman in 1974, Mary Baraka, Queen Mother Audrey Moore, one of the most influential Black nationalist women, revolutionary Pan Africans of the 20th century, et cetera. And as these attendees, both elders and, and, and uh, middle aged people and little Black girls and boys, are waving the tricolor RBG, red, black, and green, the Garveyite uh, revolutionary Pan African colors. Owusu Saudakai concluded an impassioned speech for global African liberation, leading the chance, we are an African people. We are an African people. We are an African people. This resurgence in the Black Power Movement terrified the national security apparatus in the United States, Canada certainly the Western world. So part three, concluding section. If it was unclear before 
Thanks to white observers, it became crystal clear that the triangulation of revolutionary Pan-Africanism in the Atlantic world posed the greatest threat to Western hegemony, capitalist exploitation. I include a little bit of multimedia there. Uh, my RA actually did that because I couldn't figure out how to do it. Uh, so shout out to Vera. U.S. Intel responded to this show of revolutionary Pan-Africanism by enlisting the help of McGill University, or at least one of McGill's brightest luminaries, brilliant scientist. In 1961, at the near age of 34, Dr. Gerald Bull became the youngest professor at McGill. He was the founder of a, of a multinational uh, weapons firm called Space Research Corporation. And not pulling any punches, Gerald Bull was a ballistics genius. Right? This guy was like the greatest ballistics scientist ever. He in 19, between six, 1961 and 1967, created a, a satellite launcher, which was like a super gun that could fire projectiles into space. McGill invested in his firm uh, and with a $200,000 seed capital. The Pentagon to tell you a lot about this individual, right? So he's doing work that the US empire thought was invaluable in terms of its Cold War interest. The Pentagon funded gold as well. McGill's existing projects in Barbados provided opportunity for Bull to use Barbados as a launch site, literally. He was young, he was ambitious, he was well networked. Bull spent a decade helping to build the Canadian Armaments and Research Development Establishment, which collaborated with the U.S. Army's Ballistic Research Laboratory and other classified weapons development entities in the United States and Canada. So the Caribbean was not only a frontier in the Cold War, but also an important site for weapons development. People know this. Because of Barbados' proximity to the equator, the island provided favorable launch, launching uh, conditions. Um, whether for satellites or artillery. Scientific probe launchings, missile engineering development flights, and long range gun performance testing occurred on the southeast coast of Barbados, where crews would launch projectiles towards Ascension Island, which was between Brazil and Angola. These various expeditions required a bevy of surveillance, radar, workers, including a permanent U.S. and Canadian staff of 75 engineers, technicians, support personnel, et cetera. In fact, Barbados Oceanographic and Meteorological Experiment Initiative, which was uh, a joint project that brought together various U.S. departments and agencies, also used the same facilities. At its official vertical launching site, where projectiles were launched into space. Space Research Corporation commissioned 500 launchings using a multitude of high caliber cannons and guns. Under the guise of scientific advancement, Washington DC and the Ottawa bureaucrats turned Barbados into a fortified island that advanced the West Cold War interests in the Caribbean Basin. Gerald Bull found the Space Research Corporation as a joint U.S.-Canadian venture to maximize its potential for Cold War strategic funding. In fact, the headquarters of Space Research Corporation was based in North Troy, Vermont, and Highwater, Quebec. When I talk about the U.S.-Canadian borderlands, I'm not making this stuff up. This is the most important weapons manufacturer or one of in the, in the Western world, right? founded by a Canadian McGill uh, PhD graduate, uh, 
a Pentagon defense contractor, and he places his U.S. Canadian multinational corporation literally on the U.S. Canadian border between Quebec and Vermont. Let's do some of these materials so I can wrap up. The United States and Canada were not the only countries that benefited from Space Research Corporation's weapons technology. A confidential source living in the United States revealed that a group of South African, white South Africans, purchased and restored 155 millimeter cannons from Space Research Corporation in 1976, despite South Africa having an arms embargo placed on it. And I quote, the guns were completely dismantled and placed in large crates and tubes, end quote. The South African government purchased these weapons for $3.6 million using various shell corporations, some based in Liechtenstein um, and other parts of Europe. It was a multi-million dollar investment into Space Research Corporation's weapons. An unidentified employee of Space Research Corporation traveled between Antigua and South Africa on multiple occasions to facilitate the 1976 deal. Around the same time that the Canadian government designated Space Research Corporation as a vital entity. Okay, this is Cold War jargon for the state has significant strategic interest in the success of this multinational weapons manufacturer. In August of 1977, Space Research Corporation shipped 560 projectiles, radar, and other equipment from St. John, New Brunswick to Antigua aboard this vessel, this German vessel called the Tuga Lalande. The Tuga Lalande made two stops in Antigua that the captain conveniently failed to record in the maritime logbook. During a loading session, one of the cranes literally collapsed um, on the ship, crashed onto uh, um, some of the containers, which broke open, and the black longshoremen who worked in Antigua's port noticed what the containers were carrying, um, weapons parts. Yeah. They immediately informed Tim Hector, who was actually one of the organizers of African Liberation Day on the island of Antigua. And Hector and Roosevelt Douglas were very good friends. Douglas was the person who helped bring Owusu Sabakai to Canada to organize people here. Although the authorities tried many times to censor Tim Hector, he printed pictures of checks that deposited, um, deposited at a Toronto bank that Space Research Corporation had paid to senior government official to buy them off in Antigua. And the implications um, included, or the Prime Minister and his son, uh, D.C. Bird and his son, Lester Bird, had been bought off as well by this U.S. Canadian corporation. The intrigue went beyond Antigua, of course. Uh, a McGill student, computer science graduate, in fact, who worked for Space Research Corporation in Troy, Vermont, traveled to South Africa in October 1977 to verify that the corporation's weapon systems worked properly. His superiors told him, instructed him, that the trip must be discreet to avoid adverse publicity. Upon arrival, South African officials basically helped him bypass customs so that no one stamped his passport. A few months later, or a few days later, pardon me, on the 20th of October, 1977, an African revolutionary named Joseph Nkomo, head of Zimbabwe's African People's Union, visiting Canada, Ottawa in particular, noted at a press conference that there was a Canadian firm that had supplied white Rhodesian 
forces with 900 tons of small arms. So the word had gotten out to African revolutionaries that Canada had blood on its hands, partnership with the United States. The US Canadian weapons manufacturer had many reasons to fear public scrutiny by sending weapons technical experts to South Africa, apartheid South Africa, and by inviting their or its officials to Antigua, Space Research Corporation had violated uh, UN embargo. And after South Africa assassinated Steve, Steve Biko in September 1977, the international community tightened the embargo, the terms of the embargo. Canada's federal police began investigating Space Research Corporation around October 1977 as well, uh, pursuing charges under the Export and Import Permits Act, which came with a, a maximum fine of $25,000 in five year in a five year prison sentence. As Canadian officials try to put a lid on this controversy, this very embarrassing controversy, the public relations and foreign policy embarrassment that was coming out of Ottawa was too difficult to contain. And US officials experienced that as well. In fact, US intelligence played a direct role in the Space Research Corporation South Africa affair. A senior official at the State Department found the arms smuggling inconceivable. The gun running, the weapons running to South Africa, inconceivable without CIA imprimatur, without the official stamp of the Central Intelligence Agency. They likely had a hand in it, he said. The evidence against Space Research Corporation was incontrover incontrovertible. And so too was the duplicity of the intelligence community. Dr. Bull and court filings stated that senior CIA officials, including the directorates of CIA, these are the self-anointed masters of the universe. There's no dirty war in the world of which they know not. The details of how the dirty war unfolded they get to decide which governments are toppled, which governments are aided. But Gerald Bowles, this Canadian ballistics engineer, genius fellow person, that is a directorate of CIA. And this is the person who, again, authorizes all the covert ops. So there's a director of the CIA who basically determined that Space Research Corporation would smuggle arms to South Africa to uphold fascist, white supremacist, genocidal, anti-Black regimes in, in that part of the world. Between 1976 and 1978, Gerald Bull acknowledged that at the same time that Space Research Corporation transshipped artillery shells to South Africa, US intelligence agencies had known that his company also sold weapons to Israel, which diverted these weapons to South Africa. And I'm going to be concluding in like 45 seconds. On the 25th of March, 1980, Gerald Bull pleaded guilty to providing South Africa with munitions, equipment, and technical expertise. Everywhere in the Caribbean, see, Fellows looked at Antigua with a black eye and blamed us for sending arms to South Africa. Antigua was the rally point where the weapons were brought from the United States and Canada, repackaged, and then diverted to Southern Africa. And the words that I quoted came from the former Antiguan Attorney General. This lecture, this very brief lecture, is as just a snippet of an elaborate narrative. And if you want to read the full history, which is full of all types of crazy conspiracies to destroy African peoples, to dispossess us, to subjugate us, 
And when I say conspiracy, I don't mean unfounded, but I'm, I mean the act of trying to undermine us and destroy us. Um, I encourage you to read my book. In conclusion, the CIA and the Pentagon feared geo geopolitical rivalry in Southern Africa, specifically in Angola, Mozambique, and Rhodesia. Apartheid South Africa was a gateway to smuggle arms to US proxies that fought revolutionary socialist armies in the region. African Liberation Day organizing across North America, anti-colonial revolutions in Southern Africa, buttressed by Cuban troops and Soviet weapons, terrified Washington. In response to the triangulation of, and when I say Cuban troops, I mean Cuban troops who look like most of us. This one to the right. In response to the triangulation of revolutionary pan-Africanism in the Atlantic world, US intelligence enlisted the support of US Canadian arms manufacturer that a McGill ballistic scientist founded to smuggle arms to white supremacist regimes and other US proxies in South Africa. Thank you. We have our Q&A session now. Um, does anybody here want have any questions to ask? Um, I think Salewa, if you don't mind, will you be able to monitor the questions online? Yes, Rebecca, so if there's anyone online who has a question, please just electronically raise your hand. We're going to go with the people in person first, if that's okay. And if there's anyone who has a question online, please just take notes and then we'll come to you. <clears throat> is there anyone in person with a question? Yes. yes. Uh, my name is Jeff. I'm just asking for more clarification, but thank you very much for uh for such an insightful lecture. Uh you mentioned that you know we're going to talk about three three things in the context of the black liberation movement and uh counter revolutionary strategies so, of uh Ottawa and Washington. Uh, but I, I was also keen to hear more uh because you mentioned it about how the Pan African movements uh, across the uh, Atlantic Triangle mm -hmm. has been responded to uh, a point of pro and other institutions of government that were hell bent on suppressing the movements. I was hoping whether you could share one or two uh, counter incidents, you know, the strategies that they actually introduced to sort of uh, overpower governments. Ah, yes. Uh, great question. Um, for those in, in the Zoom who might not have heard, uh, and please remind me of your name again. My name is Demi Lola. Demi Lola, yes. Thank you so much. For those who might have not have heard Demi Lola, um, we inquired about the ways that uh, revolutionary Pan-Africanists resisted the forms of Western counterintelligence, right? counterinsurgency, counterrevolution. Right? an excellent question. So I, I asked I asked the brother, the elder, the Musa Sadaka, because part of my research at the counterintelligence, counter counterinsurgency against African peoples. So I asked um, brother Musa Sadaka, Howard Fuller, like two, three years ago in, a, in an interview, given that I had gain access to um, some very serious and, and just disheartening declassified material on what the feds did to African people in the 60s and 70s and the things that are still happening. And so I asked them flat out, what did you guys do to root out the moles and the agents and the spies, et cetera, et cetera? He frankly said, we didn't have many good measures in place. And they, they, they cost them a great deal. So, 
Thank you for a wonderful uh, and thought provoking presentation. Mine is, is a bit more like theoretical or conceptual, and I was sort of returning to the questions you asked of us at the beginning of, of Pan Africanism. So, how did you reconcile the fact that Pan Africanism, which as you noted, is rooted and born of the transatlantic slave trade, of the of the uh, you know the epitome of modern capitalism, and many of the individuals, particularly Garvey that you cite, uh, advocated a form of self determined racial capitalism. In 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 that, the Garvey goes to uh, immigrants from Jamaica. Mm -hmm. He goes to seek funds to solicit to start a, a Jamaican form of Tuskegee, right? He's, mm -hmm. he's an advocate mm -hmm. of, of Washington and yes. industrial education and, and making Blacks useful laborers mm -hmm. in the machinery of capitalism. And then you cited, of course, down through to the Panthers, who are, are avowedly socialists. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I guess my question is, in, in, and again, I, you know, it's, it's sort of broad, but I'm really fascinated by the ways in which do you believe or did you find from your research mm -hmm. that we have people such as the Panthers, mm -hmm. anti-capitalist, socialist, revolutionaries, mm -hmm. is there a way out for Pan-Africanism mm -hmm. out of the quagmire of racial capitalism mm -hmm. or are they doomed in many ways to just replicate mm -hmm. the very means through which mm -hmm. became their enslavement? Mm -hmm. Ex excellent provocation and it's, um, Paul. Paul, yes, thank you so much. Excellent, excellent question. Excellent question. Um, this this issue of capitalism comes up often where Pan-Africanism is yeah. concerned. And certainly where Garveyism and you and I um, is concerned. And it's something that I actually confront head on in, in the book. Uh, because I knew that people were going to come for me. <laughs> so I said, <laughs> I'm no, not what? coming for you. I'm no, just... <laughs> no, no, that was, that was a very, just that was intrigued. just beautifully articulated and it was kind and loving. I appreciate it. But I know others will come for me. So I'm like, you know, <laughs> just get, gotta get ready to knuckle up. Yeah, get ready to knuckle up. So I actually, I argue in the introduction, and I'm laying everything out that. The UNIA, if we look at the empirical evidence, if we look at the historical record, the archival sources, if we look at Garvey's own ruminations on the UNIA and especially its flagship enterprise, right? Yeah. The Black Star Steamship Corporation line. If we look at the, uh, the driving force behind the, Black, the BSL Black Star lines um, and what Garvey articulated about it, it actually was anti-capitalism. Okay. I argue that Garvey was not a black capitalist. Garvey was actually a race first revolutionary socialist. These are the words I use in the book. Race first revolutionary socialist. How do I substantiate this claim? In October 1919, the day has eluded me, but October 1919, Garvey is traveling in the mid-Atlantic in Virginia at a place called Port town city called Newport News. And Garvey gives a speech to his followers. And he's on the on the stump, right? He is pitching and selling the Black Star Lines. He is evangelizing this, this um, corporation that has uh, seized the African world in a, a frenzy of sorts. People are excited about it, right? They capitalized it with half a million dollars. It's like capitalized, right? Half a million dollars. And Garvey says, and I quote, the Black Star Lines is the property of the Negro peoples of the world. And I say, my goodness. And I will repeat that. The Black Star Lines is the property of the Negro peoples of the world. This is a fundamentally socialist revolutionary race for socialist enterprise. Yes, they were using elements within that we might identify as capitalists, but the Garvey said the people own this, not Negro shareholders, right? Who were the few rich black folk who would exploit the labor and the material um, 
resources of the masses, but African peoples, black sharecroppers, black women working as domestics, black men working as railway porters, ordinary black people buying shares for $5 that contributed half a million dollars for them to capitalize this corporation. And Garvey said, we as a collective own it. And so I argue um, that when historians critique Garvey of black capitalism, it's actually misplaced. Garvey never ever advocated to me, capitalism is exploitation of land, labor, and capital in private hands. Garvey never, ever wanted that. He said, African peoples and masses must own our resources to transform our material conditions. And out of that, even if we're dirt poor, we must own it, we must leverage it, we must harness it to inspire our nationalism, sort of an you know, our race towards nationalism, our nation building, and our revolutionary struggle. No, thank you. That's sort of, and I think that speaks to, as historians, or, or uh, particularly the mischaracterization, sort of blind by the aesthetics of Garveyism, right? The Black Star Line, the, the militaristic mm -hmm. uh, fashion and attire, mm -hmm. and there's sort of easy connections that are made between, well, this is just a replication of you know, nationalist or capitalist, but thank you for that. Can I ask a follow up question? Sorry, sorry, just before you ask another question. I'm just sorry. I just wanted to make a comment, actually. Oh, okay. that's permitted. Uh, yeah. yeah, sure. Yeah. 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 Look, I was living in Berkeley when the Black Panther Party was organized in 1966. Wow. And uh, the students, at the university campus, at the Berkeley University campus, cooperated with the Black Panthers on a kind of a daily basis because, for example, the Panthers were uh, the bus drivers mm -hmm. in, in San, San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And you knew that if you had a Panther bus driver, there was going to be no trouble mm. on the bus. <laughs> mm. You know, that it, that, 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 that respectful social relations, yes. Huh? Yes. you know, would prevail, yes. you know, a part of, uh, of everybody. So my experience of the Black Panthers was that it was a part of the normalcy of that particular radical moment mm. in uh, uh, U.S. Uh, history. Mm -hmm. Uh, because the, the revolutionary organization of the time, the one that wanted to keep a distance from, was the SDS. Mm. You know, because they, right. and the students were a democratic society, right. you know, and they had, huh, you know, the underground movement and yeah. so forth and so on. Uh, the Panthers were open politics. They were completely open yes. politics. You know? And when it came to these questions of who who were the CIA agents? Huh? We we knew that we couldn't control that, mm -hmm. you know, in political discussions. Huh? Mm -hmm. So the first thing we always did was say, "Well, welcome to all the CIA agents among us," you know, because uh, you know, just to make it clear, you know, that everybody knew yep. uh, that they were present. Yes. Huh? Uh, and then the Black Panthers actually, out, I, I was involved in organizing a Peace and Freedom Party, so called. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it had a strategic alliance <laughs> with the Black Panthers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and actually, we, we didn't have the best uh, presidential candidate with regard to uh, uh, revolutionary or socialist or any kind of thought. Because it wound up being Eldridge Cleaver. Right. Yep. Yeah, yep. the Eldridge, Eldridge Cleaver was the huh, yeah. candidate of the combined uh, right. Black Panther and uh, some you know radical uh, movements, which by the way, in the context of California politics at that time, uh, were registered, at, at the Peace and Freedom Party was a registered political party because it got enough uh, people to sign up to pass over the threshold huh? I can't remember what it was, 50,000 people, to, but it was a huge threshold. Huh? And I remember being there on the corner 
of uh, mission that I forget what, but in San Francisco, registering voters <laughs> for, the, uh, for the Peace and Freedom Party. Huh? You know, and it was an official party, actually. Of course, huh? you know, we, and there was a, it was a ridiculously low vote for, right. uh, for Peace and Freedom, but uh, along with the Black Panthers, huh? the Strategic Alliance. Huh? But uh, the um, uh, uh, the moment, uh, the political moment at that time in Northern California allowed you to engage in that kind of politics. Mm. Like, I don't remember ever being harassed mm. for standing on the street corner and recruiting, getting signatures huh, for peace and freedom to get it registered. Okay? Uh, as a political party. So I think the context in Chicago was very different, you know, and I can't speak to uh, Chicago at all, you know, where the nastiest kind of uh, spying and repression uh, took place. And then again, New Hampshire was different, huh? you know, so uh, the, the nature of the, uh, of the party and uh, the disappeared party and of the uh, well, we were just a California outfit, huh? the Black Panther Party um, was different in different parts of the United States. Yes, that's right. And, and I think that that sometimes gets lost when you talk, uh, you know, uh, talk about a Black Panther Party as if it were a homogeneous huh? uh, tendency, because it was very different in very different places. Huh? So anyway, I just wanted to uh, say that uh, you have a real elder <laughs> in your midst. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Thank you so much. How, you know, in all of this, uh, and, uh, as a as a doctoral candidate at uh, at Berkeley. Thank you. Yeah, remarkable. Thank you. Thank you. So, sorry, we'll go to Demi and then we also have um, a question from. A couple of so why don't we take a couple and then we'll yeah but, okay. so we'll we'll take Samuel and um and then, sure. and then a couple just sure. to keep track of time sure. and then yeah. answer all together. Uh, all right. uh you might go once or twice the question. That's fine as well. Well, <laughs> I was just uh at the risk of sounding like a bit of advocate. Uh sure. would you say that yeah, these works and actions actually like merge aligned in terms of the management of the blocks. Uh, I'm glad you asked that. I'm glad you asked that. I'm, no, I'm, I'm very glad you asked that. So part of the process of, of counterintelligence and counterinsurgency and counterrevolution, um, and I, I critique our profession um, broadly as historians, but also as scholars, is that quite often I read things in the historical that other historians have written, and I'm thinking, you're just parroting FBI talking points, CI talking points. Literally, like it happens with such great frequency. Not you, I'm saying that. Yeah, it, it just happens <laughs> with such great frequency. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 yeah, that was no critique of you. <laughs> no, 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 honestly. <laughs> um, so the, the reason why I, I invoke that point is because the, the Black Star Lines was mismanaged, yes, but we seldom acknowledge how that happened. Garvey's lieutenants, most of them, a lot of the black men, um, and the UNIA had sort of a, an egalitarian-like leadership structure where there were women leaders and, and men leaders, right? Female presidents and male presidents, et cetera. Um, but a good number of Garvey's lieutenants whom he deputized to go and buy the ships and buy supplies that would be transported among the various parts of the Americas and Africa. They were spooks that worked for the FBI. And their sole purpose was to undermine it, to buy the worst ships, to pilfer money, to steal, right? To gather intel on Garvey. And Garvey, at his lowest, when the Fed, and Garvey was, he was, thrown in the, in the joint for two years before he was deported to Jamaica in December 1927. Garvey never took a penny from black folk, 
right? Garvey died a pauper. He died poor, right? Estranged from his beloved wife, Amy Jakes Garvey, his two boys. He died in, in um, June 10th, 1940 in England, in London. Garvey died penniless, but he lamented before his death that <laughs> there is no rhyme or reason to the Negroes, the Negroes uh, like pension for theft, right? And you would think, say Garvey, like why would Garvey say something that's ostensibly anti-Black? Because he didn't know that the people who were destroying the BSL from within were actually federal agents. That's how it was sabotaged. It was so promising. The only thing to do was to sabotage it. But historians, and I know you're uh, you're an Africa historian, right? Yeah. Exactly. So yeah, no, no, we're not squabbling. No squabbles here, right? But historians who should know better, like till till this day, they still write these things without a sense of irony. This is kind of embarrassing. Uh, my sisters. And then we'll take um, Mohammed Sese. Yeah, sure. So Prof Sese, um, please, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. And uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Ajete. Um, it's uh, nice to uh, put a face to the name. I've heard about you from uh, my supervisor and friend at McGill, Katrin Lu, and um, her partner. Uh, so it's really nice to see you and congratulations on, on your book. I, I have um, two questions and I will try to be um, quick. Uh, the first one, um, I would like you to speak to um, some of the, um, the narrative and language um, that was used uh, to criminalize, securitize, and demonize African liberation struggle. And my interest in this question has to do with whether there is a parallel uh, with that kind of discourse and language um, that we see um, the way that, for example, the um, Black Lives Matter movement is being demonized today by right-wing media in the, in the US. Um, I'm just wondering whether there, there, there is something there to, to explore. And my, my second question is, is, is theoretical, as um, a previous question that was asked. It seems to me that there is a, a configuration, intersection of um, ideology, capitalism, and race. And I'm wondering whether you are seeing um, a different iteration of this configuration based on history and based on place. That is, whether um, you are seeing um, a different configuration of race and ideology on the African continent as opposed to the diaspora. Thank you. I don't know. I don't fully understand the second question. Yes, I can come back. <laughs> yes, can you uh, restate the second question, please? Yes, um, I'm wondering whether the configuration of race and ideology plays out differently um, depending on history or depending on whether it is within the African continent or the diaspora. Provocation. Excellent provocation. Um, oh, so, sorry, just before you oh, yes, we'll yes, take, let's take two. Yes, we'll take the last question sure. together and okay. then you can answer sure. both of them. Um, so, okay. Keep <laughs> <laughs> do that. <laughs> so, good. Um, so, thank you very much for your presentation. It was very interesting. I am not a historian. <laughs> um, but uh, one of the things you started off was um, saying that history is cyclical, uh, which I really like the idea of thinking about history as always being present. So, with, with the research that you've done, where would you say that we are currently um, in that cyclical nature of history? And then kind of on <laughs> Damalola's point, um, you answered to say that they didn't have a way of um, sort of addressing the moles and, and all of that within all of the movements. Mm -hmm. So I guess I think now there's so many examples currently um, where African nations, uh, African peoples in many ways are um, sort of being, their movements are being co-opted. Mm -hmm. And so if we have all these ideas from history, what is it that you would say would be useful 
um, to sort of continue that Pan-African revolutionary movement. Mm -hmm. Wow, y'all, I feel like this is a job talking. Y'all really want to like, y'all really want to punish me, expose me. Goodness, I really walked into the, the lion's head. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and please, well, your, your name and then your name as well. Ruth. 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 Surname? Rodney. Yeah, Guyana. All right, that's my sister. Okay, okay. And, and you? I'm Rachel. Rachel, surname? Um, Aaron. Aaron, AA? -A? Yeah. Okay. Um, great presentation. Thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it. Um, my question sort of alludes to what was brought up previously um, by Bruce. Um, so you, you spoke about the history of Pan-Africanism. And I remember you referencing certain symbols at that revolutionary event in Washington, so I'm just the natural hair, mm -hmm. um, people mm -hmm. showing a bit more confidence in their mm -hmm. blackness. Mm -hmm. um, I'm seeing a resurgence of those symbols today um, in the natural hair movement that has, you know, occurred recently and even in, you know, people embracing Afrobeats. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering where are we on that spectrum of an Af Africanism? Like how we bear it away from Malcolm X's vision of what that was, or what Marcus Garvey's vision of what an Africanism was? Or do you think that that definition is changing and we're veering towards a new definition of what an Africanism is? Hmm. Excellent. 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 Excellent question. Okay. Um, Thanks for encouraging me to write you down, Dad. Why would I? I can't remember everything, so I write everything down. It's, it's, it's such a great strategy, Adam. All right, so I guess in my final notes as I wrap up. So, uh, Professor uh, Salewa, or Sese? Sese. Sese, yeah. Okay. Uh, regarding parallels between um, uh, black revolutionaries in the 1960s and 70s and how you know black activists um, or black militants are treated today uh, similar language indeed in terms of extremists right and the FBI a few years ago came out with a category called BIE black black identity extremists which is utter nonsense right resisting white supremacy all of a sudden labeled an extremist so um, extremists um, threats to national security, Subversives, uh, these are dog whistles which provide the state with the type of ammunition, no pun intended, uh, to either eliminate a perceived threat or contain a perceived threat. And containment happens often in the context of social death slash incarceration, especially for, for uh, Black males. Um, and then elimination is, of course, assassination. Uh, in terms of uh, your second provocation, race and ideology uh, in the African, on the African continent and the diaspora, uh, again, another very thoughtful provocation. I, I often ar I argue in the book that the type of revolutionary Pan-Africanism and race-first uh, Pan-Africanism that emerges out of the Atlantic world, we owe much of that to and now I'm speaking as a continental African, we owe much of that to our brothers and sisters in the African diaspora, in the Americas, right? They provided the intellectual heft, the impetus, the urgency in so many ways because they had lived in the belly of the beast, they had lived among Europeans and discerned certain things and realized that mm, if we do not hold steadfast onto our identity as African peoples, we will be like grounded into powder, right? And so much of that inspiration comes out of uh, the African diaspora and it certainly inspires Africans on the continent. And then there's a rich form of cross-pollination that would ensue. Um, but in this particular moment, we, um, and especially on the African continent, uh, and part of this, a lot of this has to do with the type of miseducation 
to Boyle Carter G. Woodson's uh, phraseology, the miseducation of the Negro, miseducation of Black folk, the process of conditioning that we have undergone on the African continent that prevents us from appreciating and at least leveraging some of the gems from the past in terms of how we imagine uh, the African continent, right? And so if you look at the African Union, for example, it is a, an utter, utter embarrassment, utter, utter, utter humiliation. The same entity, of, the same entity denied Aiti. Haiti is African. Haiti is African people's godfather and godmother, where revolutionary struggle is concerned. Haiti petitioned in 2016 to join the African Union. And the Negroes in Addis Ababa said, "No, we're not in Africa." In 1898, Ethiopia defeated Italy in a war at Adwa. 1896, I, I, I misspoke, 1896 in a war, I, I The first country to send a delegation were the sons and daughters of Haiti, the African sons and daughters to that same land where the AU is headquartered in these modern day embarrassments said no. Right. My, my spirit weeps for our, our brothers and sisters in Haiti, especially what's going on there right now. Where are we in terms of the cyclical nature of history, right? We are still, in the words of Ray for Logan, we are still in the native, right? African people in the Arabic word for lowest point. We are still at the lowest point, but there is there is hope that circumstances must change because that's just the cycle of the universe. But we are at a, at a low point and it is not pretty. It is not pretty in the African world, on the continent, in the diaspora of South America, in Latin America, North America. It is not pretty, our circumstances. And it, it's not looking better, given what's coming down the pipe in terms of economic restructuring um, and the ways that uh, certain reactionary tendencies are, are springing up in, in Western metropoles. Uh, Co-optation of movements, lessons learned. There are plenty of lessons, and I. I I'm not an activist, I'm just a humble, poor, lowly historian um, who probably should get paid more, but doesn't because I'm very poor and lonely. So I'm not an activist, but I do say in the book, hey, for those who are revolutionaries and, and fighters, the lessons are there, right? And this is part of the reason why. Pardon? I'll give you a couple. The, give you a couple of lessons? Yeah, no, just a couple of lessons. One of the things I, I teach my students in the year when I'm teaching US history and the history of the African diaspora is that white folk have outflanked African peoples. Europeans have outflanked African peoples on multiple fronts. They know more about African peoples than Africans know about themselves. You can't win. What struggle are you going to win when your adversary knows more, knows more about your ancestors, knows more about your deities? knows more about your inheritance than you do. No, you're just walking dead. Until we get back to the roots and know ourselves better than our adversaries know us, we will be the holders of wood and the jars of water. There's no, there's no escaping that, right? That's first and foremost. Secondly, and part of the reason why I use classified material, intelligence materials, is because it reveals what the longest serving CIA counterintelligence chief. Right? This guy was literally a master of the universe. Right? All the regimes toppled, the heads of state assassinated at home and abroad. He knows where all the bodies are buried. He was a Yale guy who grew up reading poetry and, and literature and became the greatest intelligence officers um, in the known world. His name is Angleton. I talk about him in the book. He said, deception is a state of mind and the mind of the state. Deception is a state of mind and the mind of the state. African peoples aren't too serious about their liberation. And Angleton gave, gave people the, the playbook. He said, this, this is what it is. If you think you have a democracy, so when I hear people talking about democracy, American democracy is in, is in, is a, is in danger. Y'all don't, don't even know what the heck you're talking about. Deception is a state of mind and the mind of the state. 
So there are lessons that one can learn. And again, I'm just an activist. Oh, pardon me, I'm just a historian. <laughs> just a historian. Maybe I'm a smart to be an activist. Yeah. I would be a poor, I would, I would be a poor activist um, materially. <laughs> um, I'm just an academic, pardon me. Where, where are we on the spectrum of, of Pan-Africanism in terms of Garveyism, uh, Malcolm X, et cetera? I think there's significant regression, significant regression. So a lot of what we think we see as Pan-Africanism is capitalist exploitation, right? Is outright capitalist exploitation. Right? It, is, it is meaningless representation politics and trick bags. Right? Real Pan-Africanism will unite African peoples across the world, real Pan-Africanism will ensure that African raw materials and resources enrich the African masses, not a few select African families that have had wealth going back several centuries. And a lot of that wealth is tied to transatlantic slavery. My brothers and sisters on the continent don't want to have that conversation with me. Right? Well, we better have that conversation if we really serious about the circumstance at hand. And the changing definition of Pan-Africanism. Yeah, we went from something that was formidable to something that is just toothless. And the formidable has hope. The toothless stuff, uh, well, it will create more problems. Thank you all. <laughs>